Good morning and welcome to this month's sustainability webinar. Um, in this month's webinar, we'll be looking at activating sustainability at your organization. But also, if you've already started on this journey, what might the next steps be? So welcome to the webinar. We, want, we hope you find it really informative. I would like to start by an acknowledgement of country, and that is acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our, res our respect to elders past and present. And we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people here today. Um, my name is Aleta Bosov. I'm the national leader of ESG and sustainability at BDO. And I also have another hat, and that is the national leader of IFRS and corporate reporting. Um, and I have I've just recently joked, um, but it's true, is that these two hats are becoming closer and closer um, over time because a lot of the sustainability activation is driven by reporting requirements. And a lot of the sustain sustainability information will actually end up in the annual report next to the financial report. Um, so the reporting and sustainability, really the two worlds are colliding um, as we speak. Um, <clears throat> As you know, we've got our sustainability webinar series. This is the third year we're running it. And this is the second sustainability webinar for 2024. Um, next month, we'll be looking at developing a sustainability roadmap. So today it's more higher level strategy. And then next month, we look at what a roadmap could look like, but detailed roadmap, not just an annual roadmap, and what could we do every quarter? What could you do every month? And how would you develop that for your organization? But then for the rest of the year, we're stepping through a number of things that will have to happen to get us ready for sustainability reporting, but also to help you with your sustainability strategy. Wearing my other hat, we have been running um, IFRS and corporate reporting webinars uh, for eight years now at BDO. Um, and last week, we did a really important webinar on the classification of liabilities as current or non-current. There's been recent changes. These amendments are applicable from the 1st of January this year. So somebody in your finance team, um, you know, somebody in your finance team might be interested in that. And you'll see we're doing a number of updates throughout the year and looking at the latest developments and doing a bit of a, a refresher on some problematic topics. Um, so please feel free to invite others in your organization to join these webinars. Um, today's agenda. So I would like to start with, so what is sustainability strategy? Uh, before we can activate it, what is it? Um, I also then want to go back to sustainability strategy as it is outlined in IFRS S1. So that's the very first standard issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board. I'm not going to look at the detail, but just pick up some of the principles. What do they expect? Because that will drive our broader strategy. I would then, in the third section, like to look at why is your organization exploring strat um, sustainability at this stage? So maybe you've been on the journey for a while. Maybe you're now starting to think about it. Um, but why are you on this journey? Because that really drives uh, the next steps. Some organizations could be looking at strategy and say it's focused on compliance only. So in the next section, we look at if you're leading with compliance, if that's your driver, what could that look like? What should you be thinking about? But then we also go on and say if you're leading with strategy, so you see the opportunities through sustainability, or you see the risks that sustainability pose to your business, what could that look like and how could you, how could we help you there? Now, some organizations look at compliance and strategy at the same time, and they see compliance as a subset of the strategy, um, but some see it quite different. So we'll talk through that. Then at the end, I thought it would be a good time to address some practical questions that we get asked on a regular basis. Um, you know, where do we start? How do we resource it? What's the time commitment? What's the cost commitment? 
um, what would be next steps, what would the roadmap look like, etc. So we'll end up um, with answering some of those very practical questions and give you somewhat of an idea. So we'll be starting with what is a sustainability strategy? What do we mean by that? Uh, our session today is activating that strategy, but what is a sustainability strategy? Now, I thought it would be good to go back and just have a look at, so what is strategy? If we talk about strategy for an organization, let's forget about sustainability for the moment, but what is strategy? And if you look at strategy, um, strategy is a, a general plan to achieve one or more long-term or overall goals um, under conditions of uncertainty. We don't know what's gonna happen in future. Nobody envisaged COVID-19. Um, so there's a lot of things in the future we just don't know. But this strategy is our general overall plan. How are we gonna achieve our long-term goals, our overall goals? And we know there's a lot of uncertainty, but what is our plan to kind of prove our group or uh, protect our business against uncertainty going forward and still be successful, still grow. Um, so a business strategy is an outline of the actions and decisions a company plans to take to reach its goals and objectives. So it's really important that we know what are our goals, what are our objectives, and therefore what are we going to do to reach them. And a business strategy defines what the company needs to do to reach those goals, um, which can help us guide with decision making, decision making um, with hiring staff, with resource allocation. So you can see a lot of these words I've already used in the introduction around the practical questions. You know, what resources do we need? What staff do we need? What decisions do we have to make in order to achieve long-term goals? Um, maybe a, a different way to look at strategy, a general plan um, for achieving one or more uncertain long-term goals. Um, every establishment has its own set of goals and objectives. So these are just, you know, I did some research using our friend Google and say, what can we come up with broad strategy? What do we mean by strategy? So we need goals, we need objectives, um, not just today or tomorrow, but long-term there's uncertainty coming into play, but once we know what that goal is, we can start to make decisions to work towards those goals. Um, so that's broad strategy. The other thing that I found really interesting, I always love reading the Harvard Business Review, and going back to 1996, so it's a number of years ago, um, there was an article on what is strategy. Very interesting article. I've actually included the link there for you, um, and it's available for free. Uh, by the Harvard Business Review. And the, a few things that grab my attention. If you look at strategy, the essence of strategy is choosing to perform activities differently than what your rivals do. So it's kind of your competitive advantage. So we want to do these things differently. Strategic positions can be based on customers' needs, customers' accessibility, or the variety of the company's products or services. Uh, and I, I picked that in particular because it's a real focus on customers, which is a stakeholder. Uh, ultimately, if a business wants to exist, we want to know what our customers want and we have to address um, those needs, right? So it, it's, it's customer centric. On the right hand side, trade offs are essential to strategy. They create the need for choice and purposefully limit what a company offers. Um, so we cannot just do everything to try and get to our goals. We have to be very clear, these are our goals. And therefore, if other opportunities arrive that are not aligned to our long-term goals, let's consider, because you can always reevaluate, but sometimes we have to say no to things in order to achieve our long-term strategy. So it's kind of, what are we gonna say no to? right in order to focus on what we want to achieve um the the next thing that grabbed me is the compet competitive value of individual activities cannot be separated from the whole now i thought with sustainability this is very true we've often talked about you shouldn't have sustainability activities uh, running separately to your business activities 
um, you cannot have sustainability strategy setting completely or sitting completely separate from your business strategy. Actually, the dream is when sustainability and sustainability strategy is embedded in your overall strategy, embedded in your overall risk management, embedded in governance. So many organizations would have started with sustainability initiatives. So specific governance for sustainability or strategy for sustainability or risk management around sustainability. But I do believe to be successful over the long term, those governance, strategy, risk management related activities should be merged and incorporated in the overall business governance, strategy, risk management. Um, and then the last one on the right hand side, strategic position should have a horizon of a decade or more, not a single planning cycle. Now, if you look at sustainability, this is here to stay. Um, we, we're looking at what are we doing in the short term, medium term, long term. But the essence of sustainability is long term focus. And we're not going to get all the benefits immediately. We have to play a long game. Um, so strategically, look into the future, what are your long-term plans for your business? So this is from that Harvard Business Review. And although it's written in 1996, and although it never refers to sustainability in this article, I thought there were a number of valuable things that we could apply to sustainability strategy. Because sustainability strategy should be embedded in overall strategy, and therefore all the principles of normal strategy will also apply to sustainability strategy. So uh, an article for you to read. Now, when we come back, we've talked about strategy. Let's come back to sustainability. Remember, sustainability is broad. Sustainability, I would say, would touch every aspect of your business. Because not all of these factors would be in your business, but many of them will be in your business. I think it would be hard to find a business area, a division that's not impacted by at least three, even more of the factors on the screen, right? So this is throughout your business. Nothing will be left untouched. And that's why this is sometimes such a overwhelming concept that we have to bring in sustainability, not just in the finance team, not just in the sustainability team, but every area of the organization. So I'll try and make some linkages. If you look at environmental, now obviously climate change is the one uh, across the economy, every organization, nobody immune to climate change, net zero commitments, um, we're moving to a low carbon economy, and that has an impact on every organization. So are your technology uh, carbon, um, low carbon intensity or high carbon intensity? Um, how do you do business travel? How do you do training? Is it online or is, are people flying around the globe or the country? Um, so climate change absolutely, again, potentially impacts everything. But then there's also, for a number of businesses, land use or ecological sensitivity. Think of agriculture, for example. Air and water pollution. Um, so how do your organization impact air water pollution? You look at biodiversity deforestation, again, our agricultural clients. Waste recycling and reuse. Do your business generate use, uh, uh, generate waste? Um, and, you know, how do you deal with the waste in an in, in environmental um, appropriate way? Even your suppliers, do they create, create uh, provide goods to you um, with packaging around it that cannot be recycled? Um, so how can we encourage our suppliers to think differently about packaging? Because that is often a, a big part of waste. Um, how can we reuse um, some of the products we buy, um, even our products when they sold, how could those be reused? And I'm thinking here about that whole circular economy. Um, 
one of the examples I've heard recently is, you know, I, I would never have thought about it, but if you buy shoes um, for a special event, very expensive shoes, beautiful shoes for a special event, but usually not shoes you're going to wear every day. And usually it goes with one particular beautiful dress. Um, so that pair of shoe in, shoes e end up in your cupboard. However, what if that organization is saying, you can return those shoes and we'll pay you 80% of the original purchase price to take back the shoes and we'll sell it to another customer to use it. So there's a reuse of these products. Um, and really interesting if you look um, at, at how reuse could work in so many different areas. Um, whether it is we've got broken uh, tables and chairs that are returned to the, the supplier or the retailer, do they just throw it away? Do they put it in landfill? Or do they try and repair it and sell it in another market? Um, or is it that everybody just wants brand new? Surely not. Um, so then we also look at energy efficiency. Um, so energy efficiency, do we use product that are products that are energy efficient? How can we improve that? What innovation technology, R&D opportunities are there to have products that we sell that are more energy efficient? Uh, we look at water management. We look at fresh water availability. So environmentally, so many aspects to consider. And how does it impact your organization, your activities? But also, how does it impact your suppliers before it arrives at your property? But also, once you've sold it, um, how would your products not damage um, uh, the environment? And how could it be reused? How could it be um, energy efficient, etc.? Now, environmental, often for some businesses, um, are harder to understand, to apply. Maybe climate change is the one difference that People are starting to, to get their head around that. Um, however, social is the one that I think most entities can say, we understand this. We all have um, people who work in our business. We all have customers who are people. Um, we are a people business. We operate in a community of people. Um, and they saw that, therefore, the social factors make sense. Um, so here we look at diversity and equity inclusion. Uh, we look at employee engagement, um, we look at human rights in our supply chain, uh, modern slavery, we look at customer satisfaction, so important. We said earlier on strategy, it has to be about customers, customer needs, and if we can start to track feedback from customers and customer satisfaction and respond to those, surely that's good for our business. So even customer ratings, customer feedback, that's part of broader sustainability. Data protection, cybersecurity, privacy, incredibly important, becoming more and more important. If an organization wants to continue to exist and attract customers and people to do business with them, people want to know that that organization is looking after the data, is protecting the data, following all the pro protocols. Um, health and safety. Uh, with COVID, we've seen the responsibility of organizations on employees and mental health, community engagement. Um, we sit in a community, the jobs we create in the community. We think of First Nations, but it's not only First Nations, it's all the people within Australia, how we interact with the community, that businesses are not just seen as uh, trying to make money, but putting money back into the community, uplifting the broader community. Um, and then wealth creation and employment, which is important. <clears throat> if an organization creates jobs, pay people appropriately, that is good again for the community, for the people, all within social. I would say most organizations, when we start to work with them and we look at sustainability, social is the one that most organizations already have most activity, already have a good story to tell, Maybe all the great things they do are not told, not gathered, not put together in a nice package. They do amazing things, but it's a best kept secret. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential to look at social factors and how can we better communicate all the great things organizations do, which is slightly different to environmental. With environmental, it is 
do you, uh, do you understand potentially the damage of the problems around environmental factors? Strategically, how can we do it better? What new initiatives can we put in place? How can we address it? Where social often organisations already do great things is how do we communicate that? And then governance. Now, governance, incredibly important, should actually be the starting point. Um, you know, how do boards look at strategy, look at sustainability? How committed is the board to strategy, to sustainability um, or sustainability strategy? So it has to start with the board. And how do they do that? Is it subcommittees? Is it the Audit and Risk Committee? Um, how do they get executives and management involved? How do executives and management communicate what sustainability is through the whole organization? If we work on the premise that sustainability impacts absolutely every part of the business, it means every staff member in the organization needs an appreciation of what sustainability is, what all the environmental aspects, social and government aspects are, so that everybody are tasked to try and identify opportunities for the business, identify risks for the business, um, and address those and empower to speak up and, and raise concerns, but also identify and raise opportunities. Um, obviously, ethical behavior incredibly important. Modern slavery, we've talked about stakeholder engagement, um, you know, if you're in charge of governance of an organization, knowing who your stakeholders are, because the stakeholders are the people, um, the really important, the people giving money, the people buying, the people working, who are the stakeholders? Um, do we engage with them on a regular basis, get their feedback? Um, bribery and corruption, what do we do in that space? Anti-money laundering, a risk and opportunity, oversight, and then also remuneration and executive compensation. Um, so the transparency around um, remuneration and executive compensation. And, and you would have seen yesterday, um, information has been disclosed of all the large organizations, gender pay gap information. It's only once we get reporting, disclosure, transparency, um, that we see change. And I think it will be really interesting now that all that gender pay gap information of so many organisations are freely available, uh, what change we'll see around gender uh, pay gap and how that will be addressed. Um, so maybe the other thing to say, all of these sustainability measures um, impact your business or many of them are in your business, impact your business every area. But what we know is that often activity initiatives are driven once we get reporting and once we get that transparent information um, and then there's accountability that goes with it. At the moment, from a standard setting perspective, uh, climate change is IFRS S1, the first sustainability disclosure standard issued globally. Um, so there's one to say pick your topics and then IFRS S2, sorry, is looking at climate change. Um, so climate change is getting a lot of focus by our clients, by the community, by governments. As we get IFRS S3, S4, S5, let's say we deal with all these topics, S24 in the end, or S25 in the end, more and more there will be a focus, there will be transparency. Similar to climate change, similar to gender pay gap information, similar to, uh, to modern slavery statements, similar to payment times reporting. Um, so all those initiatives to require organizations to report, put information on a public record, put it with a regulator, which will make it available, drives sustainability. But that is a compliance drive. So there's always this balance between, do you wanna be driven by compliance and wait for compliance to come in? Or do you want to be thinking about this strategically? What are the risks and the opportunities for your business? So that's the two things to, to weigh up. So we've talked about strategy, and then I talked about sustainability, another recap of how broad sustainability is. So what is sustainability strategy? Um, the best definition I could find, a sustainability strategy outlines 
how the organization is proposing to generate social, environmental, economic value for their stakeholders, again, stakeholders, through their operations, their products and services, and how they will manage risks. And it will identify priorities, KPIs, and targets to be tracked. I think this is a beautiful overview of a sustainability strategy. We have to focus on our environmental factors, our social factors, our governance factors, but ultimately we want to create social value, environmental value, economic value, economic value not to be forgotten. Um, it is all about stakeholders, engaging with stakeholders, understanding their expectations. And then how do we adjust our operations, our products, our services? to manage risks, but also to explore opportunities. Um, so if we've got that sustainability strategy, uh, what are the priorities, what are the KPIs, what are the targets? <clears throat> Incredibly important that sustainability is just part of broader strategy for an organization. It's not a separate thing. Um, if we go on and we look at, I always try and sense check with the reporting requirements that we expect to see in future. And IFRS S1 um, talks about sustainability strategy in paragraph 25B, and it says sustainability strategy is the approach the entity uses to manage sustainability related risks and opportunities. So it's very short. I think our previous um, definition on the previous slide more extensive, but they say, how do you manage your sustainability related risks and opportunities? Um, so to create value. And then they go on and they say in paragraphs 28 and 29, these are the kind of things that you will have to report. So this will not be boilerplate reporting. This will be organizations saying, how have we um, addressed sustainability related risks and opportunities? and to communicate that to all the stakeholders. And they say very specifically in paragraph 29, specifically an entity shall disclose information to enable users of the general purpose financial statements to understand. So basically stakeholders to understand the risks and opportunities um, that they think um, the organization is facing. So in paragraph 29A, what are the risks and opportunities facing the organization, sustainability related risks and opportunities. Then they would also say in paragraph B, um, what, um, what are the current and anticipated effects of those risks and opportunities on the entity's business model and the entity's value chain? So not just these are our risks and opportunities around sustainability. How have we adjusted? How do we intend to adjust our business model? to manage the risk, explore the opportunities. What does this mean to our value chain? Then they also talk um, about um, the effects of the risk and opportunities on the strategy and decision-making, but also, and this is important, what would these sustainability risks and opportunities mean for your financial position, your balance sheet? value of assets and liabilities. What will it mean for financial performance, your profits, your losses? What will it mean for cash flow? And not just short term, also medium term, also long term. And therefore, it actually feeds into the last one. What is the entity's expected resilience? How resilient is our strategy and our business model to deal with these sustainability related risks and opportunities? These are the broad things to consider. So from a strategic perspective, do we know what our risks and opportunities are around sustainability? Do we know what that will mean for our business model, our supply chain? Do we know what it will mean for our decision making? What will it mean for our financial statements, not just now, but projected into the future? And then also how resilient are we? So what have we got in place to protect us? Um, how are we going to explore opportunities? So very interesting, this reporting standard is giving us a really good idea 
from a strategic perspective, what are all the things we should be thinking about, not just to be ready for the reporting and the transparency that's coming, but what are the good things to do from a strategic perspective? Um, so it's a very practical standard if you think about it. So having talked about sustainability strategy and what sustainability strategy is and the importance of it, let's look at um, why is your organization exploring sustainability? I think this is critical. When any organization thinks about strategy, normal strategy, it starts with your why and your purpose. Um, I think in a similar way, when we talk about sustainability strategy, we have to understand, so what is driving the organization? Why are you attending this webinar today? Why do you want to know about sustainability? Why do you know about sustainability strategy? Why do the people in the office ask you questions about sustainability and sustainability strategy? And usually, um, it's a strategic imperative. People realize we have to adjust. There are risks coming our way. There are opportunities. And we have to adjust to mitigate the risk, to explore the opportunity. So that it's all about strategy. So that would be often um, entities that don't have particular compliance requirements coming their way, but they understand that there's a strategic reason for them to do these things. On the other hand, a lot of organizations are currently scrambling because they realize there's compliance um, coming their way, reporting, mandatory reporting, assurance, audit, etc. So it's absolutely driven by compliance. And it's not just that mandatory sustainability reporting, it is we have to do a modern slavery statement. We have to disclose gender pay gap information. Um, we have to do payment times reporting. Um, there's a lot of compliance coming our way through various rules and regulations. Um, there's the Climate Change Act. Um, there's the Inga Act. Uh, so it's all just compliance. So it's either strategic or it's compliance, or for some organizations, it's actually both. And we see that in a number of places. So let's explore a little bit. Uh, from a strategic imperative, the people looking at this from a strategic point of view understand um, that this is driven by access. Now, I have to tell you, uh, I think at the moment, on a daily basis, I'm hearing stories about access risks and access opportunities. Clients are sharing and we are privy to conversations where this is becoming clearer and clearer. Uh, so access to capital, we know that investors are looking at the entities they invest in and evaluating whether they'll stay there or whether they'll move their money to entities that are more committed to sustainability, committed to climate change, committed to reducing their carbon footprint, um, committed um, to not be involved with any um, breaches of modern slavery, etc. Um, so investors are making these decisions, investors are asking these questions, absolutely. We also know and we hear these stories of so many clients that are actually receiving communication from their banks who provide their debt financing um, and saying, we want to know the following things, and maybe it's five questions, maybe it's 10 questions, but it's initial screening, um, which kind of indicates that, you know, there's some initial screening, and then it will ramp up to, uh, you know, tell us more, make certain commitments. Um, and I wonder if one day this will start to impact and become part of bank covenants. So we know banks are reaching out, financiers are asking these questions. We know this. Um, markets, absolutely customers who buy from you will come to you and say, in order for me to continue to buy from you, we need as a minimum certain information. Um, so it might be, we need to know that you've got a modern slavery policy but not just that you have a policy, that you enforce it, that you do due diligence, that you push into your supply chain. 
um, they could say, um, in order to continue to supply your goods to us, in order for us to stay a customer, we need you to reduce your carbon footprint. We need you to reduce uh, a report on your carbon footprint. Um, in order for us to stay a customer, we need you to ensure certain privacy requirements over our data. So markets, customers, um, you know, we always use the example about the young people buying and that they are interested in environmentally friendly products. Um, and it was always about a retail scenario where younger people are, you know, spending money at organizations, environmentally friendly, um, committed to sustainability measures. What we see now, we knew it was coming, but it's happening, is where customers are reaching out to their suppliers and saying, well, you need to do the right thing. Um, we want to do the right thing. Your customers might have made public statements on how committed they are to X, Y, Z within sustainability, and they cannot do it alone. And therefore, they come to you and want you as a supplier to play your part. Um, and they won't just come to you, um, you know, because you're, you're, you're a large organization. They will look at their suppliers in the first instance and identify where do they spend most of their money. And they will speak to those suppliers. So if you are a key supplier to a customer, they will start to speak to you. But over time, they will speak to all suppliers. Um, so it's a, it's a timing thing, it's continuous improvement. And then lastly, people, we know for social, people wanna work for an organization that care about the environment, care about people, um, don't wanna work for an organization uh, that are not doing the right thing by the community, et cetera. So incredibly important access. Um, so that's the strategic imperative. Now we've talked about the compliance imperative and this is becoming a reality in Australia. Um, so we've got draft legislation that came out in January and we're waiting for the final legislation um, and the, the final Australian standards, et cetera. Um, so we can see that there will be compliance requirements on group one, two and three entities over the next three, four years. I just wanna be very clear many entities look at this and they say oh so happy um we're not caught by group one group two group group three we're free that's the wrong way to look at this you have to go back to this if you are a supplier to a group one group two group three entity or a supplier of a supplier of a group one group two group three entity if you want to attract um, debt or equity capital it doesn't matter your size. If you want people to work in your business, you have to think about this. This is the compliance imperative, right? There's some people that's just looking at this, but there's a bigger strategic question overlay here uh, for these organizations, but also for entities in the supply chain of these organizations. Um, so previously we've shared a bit of a a best practice roadmap for those group one entities. So if you're looking at compliance and if your driver is compliance, we thought let's give you a bit of an idea what that would look like for you. I often say if compliance is driving you, you'll start at the top of this roadmap. And this is very high level roadmap um, and we'll explore this in greater detail next month. But you'll see there's three streams. There's carbon accounting, climate disclosures, and then general strategic priority stakeholder engagement at the bottom. So if you focused on compliance, you will start with carbon because that will be a, a critical part of the first compliance requirements, specifically scope one and two, and you cannot do scope one and two if you don't have a boundary document. And then you'll move on to scope three. Um, if it's about compliance, you'll know that from a climate perspective, we already have to do the TCFD recommendations, but we also have to say, how do we have to expand on those to be ready for IFRS S2 of the Australian standards? If you're only looking at compliance, you might not look at that third stream because we don't know when that disclosure will become mandatory. It might be 2026 in Australia. We don't know, that's why it's an orange. However, strategically, 
really impor important to understand what's the current state of play across everything in sustainability. What do your stakeholders want? How do you identify the gaps? How do you address the gaps? However, if you're just looking at compliance, you'll start at the top and work your way down. Um, we also did a version for group two entities. Now you can see for a group two entity, they've got more time to get ready in theory, if they are driven by compliance only. But if group two entities realize that they have customers who are group one, um, they will understand that those customers will be looking at them and group three entities and smaller entities, and they will ask for certain information. Now, let's be careful. If you are group two, group three, or smaller entities, there may not be a requirement for you in 2025 to do a sustainability report in your annual report. So you might not have to do fancy climate risk assessment, scenario analysis, and resilience studies, but I can tell you the one thing that will hit you is through your supply chain, your customers will ask for carbon, carbon footprint. They might ask for other things as well, but as a minimum, carbon is the name of the game and that question will be asked. So if you just wanna focus on compliance, this roadmap might be useful. However, if you think in your economic system, in your ecosystem, there will be pressure for this information, um, not through an annual report, but by reporting to customers or investors or the bank, you have to act earlier. So again, if you're driven by compliance, you'll start at the top. If you're driven by strategy, that bottom part, um, you'll start there. You'll start from the bottom and say, listen, compliance is not the thing. Compliance is a few years off, but I want to start with stream three. I want to understand who my stakeholders are and what they want. So compliance start at the top, strategy start at the bottom. Um, Maybe before I, I move on, interestingly, most of the clients that we're currently working with and helping, they are doing a dual approach. They start at the top, so they start with carbon footprint measurement, but at the same time, they also want us to start at the bottom and say, who are our stakeholders? Let's engage with the stakeholders and understand their broader needs. We know these stakeholders um, will say carbon, so we know that, that's why we're already doing the work on carbon stream one. But let's identify what else they want. What are the other topics? And that's why how stream one and stream three work together. Um, so it's really important to understand where do you sit in this ecosystem? If your organization is the entity there in red, we would think, who are your suppliers? Who are your customers? What are their information needs? Who are your investors? Who's giving you money? Who are making donations if you're a not-for-profit? Who are your financiers? What information would they want to continue to give you money? And who are your employees and what are their expectations? So you could even do a desktop review of identify your largest suppliers, largest customers, largest investors, and see what public statements they've made around sustainability metrics, and that could guide what you do. So you have to understand your stakeholder expectations. Um, coming back to what are the information these stakeholders want? So a lot of these stakeholders might not want to see a sustainability report in the annual report, and it's not mandated for you, but they might want to see your carbon footprint. So this is an extract of the BDO Australia carbon footprint for 2023. I just want to put it there as an example. It could be that your customers are saying, we want something like this. This is all we want. We want your scope one, scope two, scope three. Every year, some of our um, clients, um, their investors want it quarterly, but give it to us every year. Um, but there's interesting things in here. Give us the percentage of each category of your total footprint. Um, show year on year how it's changed, potentially improved give us the intensities, and then they'll also ask, what are your targets? What are you gonna do about the big categories? So if you look at BDO Australia, 97% of our carbon footprint is scope three. Um, and if you look at that, you'll see purchased goods and services make up around 80% in 2023 of our carbon footprint. 
So if we want to do something about our carbon footprint, we have to look at purchased goods and services. So our procurement team would have to look at purchased goods and services, how we can get those suppliers that make the biggest part of purchased goods and services uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. So you can see how your customers will want this information so they can get an idea where the risks are with the various customers. And then they'll put pressure on you to address um, the biggest categories. Don't have to address all of them at the same time, but address the biggest ones. Um, so if you look at that scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, just a recap. If your entity is sitting in the middle, scope one, that's what you control. Um, easy to make changes there. Scope two is an upstream emission because you buy electricity and bring it into your business, but it's got its own little special area. Um, so purchase electricity, you can decide whether you buy renewable energy or not, etc. Again, fairly easy. But if you look back, just look at BDO Australia's carbon footprint as an example. 97% of our carbon footprint is in scope three. So if we look at what we can control, scope one, scope two, roughly 3%, even if we bring that 3% down to zero, we're not moving the needle because the 97% is sitting in upstream scope three and downstream scope three. Upstream is all the things that really come through your suppliers to your business. And then downstream is once the goods, the services leave your business, what happens? So that's customers. So you need information from your suppliers and you need information from your customers in order to measure scope three. In order to reduce scope three, you need cooperation of suppliers and cooperation of your customers. Um, so again, strategically, it's important to know what is your baseline scope one, scope two, scope three, so you can identify which categories are the biggest, who should you reach out to first in order to make a difference. If you're leading with compliance, um, your first step will be carbon footprint. Absolutely. Um, and your first step in a carbon footprint would be define your carbon inventory boundary. And we are seeing the common downfall is that entities rush to do calculations without first identifying what is the inventory boundary, organizational boundary, but also operational boundary. It's critical. Um, then you need to develop a methodology. Similar to developing accounting policies for your financial statements, you need a methodology to measure your carbon footprint after you've done the boundary. And only then can you move on and say, based on my boundary, based on my methodology, what data do I need? And then you collect data. Many entities run to, rush to data collection and then they get the wrong data, too much data, waste their time, spin their wheels. So for us to be efficient on the money, what's the boundary, what's the methodology, what data do we need as a minimum? What is the role of technology? So I usually say it's really important to do the boundary, the methodology, do scope one and two, potentially scope three um, on estimation and identify what data is readily available, what technology you have in place, what technology would be best for you. So we could help with you know, matching you up with technology. If we have some knowledge on what you already have in place, what you need, what your methodology is. Um, so that carbon footprint baseline is incredibly important because it identifies where to focus your time and energy which categories in your baseline, if you reduce it, would give you the biggest bang for your buck and your time. Um, and then once you've got a baseline, once you've got a really good understanding of your baseline, uh, once then you can start to develop plans on how you're going to reduce those categories, that baseline, and only then can you set targets. If you don't have a baseline, you can't have a target. If you don't have a baseline, you don't have understanding, you don't have plans to reduce that baseline, how can you publish a target? Uh, because then you have greenwashing, right? If you have a target without a baseline, without plans to support reaching that target, um, you'll be guilty of greenwashing. So that is if you're leading 
with compliance, you'll start with carbon. Absolutely. If you are leading and you are driven by, by strategy, um, this is a really good document that you can download from our website where we look at how can we activate sustainability? How can we help you to develop that strategy? And in this checklist, and I've got screenshots from that checklist, we start by number one, assessing what you have in place. Number two, we look at what do stakeholders want? Then we identify the gaps and commit to address those gaps. Then we measure, we collect the data. So you can't commit to things if you're not measuring, you can't see the change, you can't see change over time. And then you report. Now report don't have to be a fancy, glossy, separate sustainability report. Doesn't have to be a report in your annual report. The report could be in a position to report to stakeholders. And that's what we're seeing a lot. Um, you know, investors send you a questionnaire that you have to fill in on a quarterly or annual basis. So a lot of that actually happens. So reporting is not necessarily a fancy report. It could be reporting to stakeholders and then we improve. Once we've got a baseline, how do we improve? And so in this checklist, I've given you some information on how do we assess um, the current state um, and we can help with that. I've given you information on how to reach out to stakeholders. How do we identify who these stakeholders are? How do we identify who are the more important stakeholders? How do we engage with them, um, et cetera? So just some ideas. Um, I've given you some ideas on now that you know what the gap is between what you have and what stakeholders want, um, how do you decide what to address? And you can't do all at once. So what's the plan on do it over time? Then how do you measure it? And ultimately, how do you report? Again, here it's about publishing a fancy report, but it could be as simple as completing a questionnaire for an investor or a stakeholder, and then obviously improve. How do we reduce the carbon footprint? How do we improve our cybersecurity? How do we improve our diversity, equity, and inclusion numbers, et cetera? So that's the strategy. If you not, if you don't know what you currently have, if you don't know what your stakeholders and your customers, your uh, shareholders want, how do you know what to work on? Um, so you have to know currently what do you have, what do they want, what are the gaps, how do you progress? Um, to be, enable you to report, to communicate, uh, and to make commitments. So I'll end off with some practical questions uh, to get started. And I, I just have to say it's a really warm, hot day in Melbourne. So I'm looking at that ocean and I'm thinking I need to be there. I need to be in that water to cool down. Um, so I hope you are cool where you are. Um, so practical questions. Very first question. What is your sustainability why? Why are you here today? Why is your business looking at this? Why is the board asking about it? Why? Is it customers? Is it investors? Is it strategy broader? Is it compliance? Why? Because once you know the why, we can strategically develop a response to the why. If we don't know why, it's really hard to come up with an appropriate strategy to address the why. So this is the start. Then people ask, how do we start? Now, I think often it is um, some organizations start once there's these pressures and they receive questionnaires, or it is um, they realize it's coming. But how do we start? I think the place to start is at the governance level. The very first thing is to get the board on board. The board needs to understand the importance of sustainability for the business, for risks, for opportunities, for the business. If the board is not on board, it's going to be a tough gig. So very important, if you're the CFO, if you're the CEO, if you're in sustainability, we need to get the board involved. That's step one. Um, at BDO, I've spent a lot of time getting our board on board years ago. Once the board said a letter, we agree, we support, let's go, I could go to the business 
I could go to the executive, I could go to the partners, I could go to the staff and say, the board says this is important. The board is given the green light, let's go. Um, so how do we start? It has to be at that governance board level. Um, where do we start? That will depend on what is the drive here. Is it is the risk compliance risk? Is the risk um, strategic stakeholders, et cetera? Um, I think it's really important to understand your why and try and come up with a strategy to address the why, whatever the why is. People often ask me, who should be leading this? Um, in my view, the CFO should be leading this. So the board should be pushing it and should be demanding the CFO to respond. And even if it's strategy, um, the CFO these days are like a CFO value officer, as we talked before. It's not just about financials. It's not just number crunching. It is what is the strategy to manage the risks and opportunities for the business and how that strategy supports the numbers and the financials or could impact the financials. Um, sustainability, in order for this to get traction, we need the CEO um, and the CFO to be involved. So obviously the board will say, CEO, strategy, this is your thing. The CEO will say, I need the CFO to be across this because it's going in the annual report. It's got an impact on financial numbers. Um, so I would say, Practically, the person leading the working group within the organization, the CFO. But the CEO can't distance themselves from it because this has got a big impact on the strategy of the business that they're leading. So we should be leading the practical working group, let's say CFO, leading the charge internally, the CEO. Um, you know, at, at BDO, for example, our CEO, Tony Schiffman, if he's not behind sustainability at BDO, we've got an uphill battle. Luckily, Tony is. Tony is extremely supportive of sustainability and sustainability initiatives at BDO. Without CEO support, it's a problem. So we've got the board behind us. We've got our CEO behind us. But where the rubber hits, hits the road to get the work done, usually the CFO. Um, who should be involved? Now, here we need finance people involved. We need people in culture. We need marketing involved. We need um, sustainability people. Can I tell you, we need representations of every part of the business involved if we want to bring transformation across the whole business. So if you're just looking at compliance, this will be driven by finance team and they'll be involved. Sustainability people potentially. If you are looking at strategy, if you're looking at strategy and transforming your business, it's representative from everywhere. Um, the representation will be driven by what your stakeholders have told you and what your key focus areas will be, because maybe your key focus areas initially will be cyber, so you need IT there. Maybe your key focus areas will be customer satisfaction, so that will be salespeople. Um, so depending on what your stakeholders want, that will drive who's involved, but if you want full-scale transformation, it's everybody in the business. Um, do we need upskilling? Absolutely. Um, everybody don't have to know how to do carbon accounting, but everybody have to understand the importance of all of this to their business, to their task. So in, uh, um, sustainability is incredibly important. Resourcing needs, time, money, people. I think next month we'll look at that when we do a more detailed roadmap. Um, I often think it's important um, to first look at that broader strategy and then convert it into a roadmap, add priorities to the roadmap, add timeframes to the roadmap, think about the skills for the priority areas before you can decide who would be the appropriate people, what would be the money and the time involved. Do we need technology? I would say over time, yes. Um, we need technology. Um, I don't think there's a magic bullet yet, uh, but it depends on what you already have and what would work with that. And then finally, what does the roadmap look like? Um, so I've given you some high level roadmaps today uh, on suggestions, um, very compliance driven potentially. The last stream was strategy, but I think we need to look at a very, you need that high level roadmap, 
what's our plan over five years and then how does it play down into a roadmap over the next 12 to 18 months on a monthly basis and that's when you know the time the money the people you need over the next 12 to 18 months and, and you have a rolling roadmap potentially and we will talk about that next month um, so how can BDO help uh, we do carbon accounting which is measurement of your carbon footprint or if you have um, ICCUs, um, Australian Carbon Credit Units, um, and you have to account for it in your financials, we can help. Sustainability reporting, whether it's to a stakeholder, whether it's a voluntary report, whether it's a formal report in an annual report, we can do reporting and help you on various aspects. We can help you with sustainability and uh, sustainability strategy. We can help you with decarbonization strategy, but the broader strategy and transformation and then if you are reporting and your stakeholders asking for assurance, we can do assurance as well. Um, I've got a bit more of a description about core services. Um, we have some additional services we provide. Um, we've got newsletters. Last week, our sustainability news for February was circulated. Um, we've got online learning. We've got these webinars. Um, and this is just a bit of a breakdown of the various people across BDO that you could contact for various aspects. So I work across carbon accounting, sustainability reporting, and also sustainability strategy. Um, and then we've got audit partners leading the charge across sustainability assurance. But you can see for sustainability strategy, what we've talked about here today, a Brett Spicer would look at sustainability strategy in Brisbane, Justin Harness in Sydney, Christy Porter in Perth, Visty Dickens in, uh, in Sydney together with uh, Justin, um, and then I'm looking after it in Melbourne. But please reach out to any of us and we'll direct you the right way um, to help you. Thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar. Really appreciate the time um, and that you, 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 you're joining and that you're trying to find out more about sustainability. Sustainability is a movement, it's gathering momentum, and it's all about continuous improvement. So thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day.